ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وسلم تسليما كثيرا Indeed, all praises to Allah, we praise Him, we seek His aid and we ask His forgiveness, and we seek the refuge of Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evils of our deeds. He whom Allah guides, none can misguide, and he whom Allah misguides, none can guide. And I bear witness and testify that there is no God worthy of worship except for Allah alone without partners, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and his final messenger. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu taqullah, li taqullah haqqa tuqatihi, wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد to proceed the best of speech is the speech of Allah عز وجل and the best of guidance is the guidance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And the worst of all affairs are those that are newly introduced into the religion. Every newly introduced affair in the religion is an innovation. And every innovation is a misguidance. And every misguidance is in the fire of hell. Before I delve into our topic today, I would like to begin by thanking the brothers whose efforts resulted in this fruition. The brothers who have collaborated together to make this event possible. And likewise thank them for extending this kind and noble invitation to me to participate in this khayr, to participate in this act of worship, namely the study and discussion of the texts of the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Sunnah of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah jalla wa ala to reward them for their efforts and to make their efforts successful. I ask Allah to reward those who have organized and those who have participated and likewise the scholars that have dedicated some of our, their time and likewise the du'at. May Allah make this heavy on the scales of everyone who partook in making this event a success. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our efforts sincerely for Him and to make them heavy on our scales in the day, on the Day of Judgment. And I also want to mention in this uh, introduction, that today's topic was chosen for me. I did not really have a hand in choosing it. Nonetheless, I was extremely pleased to find out the topic that was chosen for me. It happens to be something that is dear to my heart. And likewise, a topic I believe is extremely important to address, especially in the times that we live in. And due to the gravity of this particular topic, namely the importance of the scholars, I understand that this is something that needs to be covered with precision and with clarity. And I come to the table with limited resources. But I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant me success and the strength to give this topic the covering or coverage that it deserves. Because inshallah, as we shall see, as we keep talking about this, it will become clear that this is a topic that all Muslims need to have a good understanding, a solid and thorough understanding of. Perhaps as a preface to this topic, it behooves us to discuss two introductions that will help us understand what it is exactly that we are approaching. Number one, to clarify what is knowledge. By discussing what is knowledge, we will remember why it is the scholars are important, because they are the vessels of knowledge. Allah Azza wa has put the knowledge in their chests and made them the carriers of knowledge. And the second is an introduction by which we can distinguish between our topic today and other similar topics that are related, such as the matter of the virtue of the scholars. The virtues of the scholars are many. So perhaps our topic today, the importance of the scholars, can be considered a subtopic of the general topic, which is the virtue of the scholars. But I wanted to make a point of distinguishing between these two because today we will be specifically talking about the importance of the scholars likewise the matter of distinguishing between the scholars and those who act like them but are not from them this is also a very important topic but again it is not our topic today 
as for knowledge itself, then knowledge is, as Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala defined it, العلم قال الله قال رسوله قال الصحابة knowledge is Allah said meaning the Quran قال الرسول meaning the Sunnah of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الصحابة meaning the knowledge that was left behind from the companions of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم this is knowledge Allah said the messenger said and the companions of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم said the scholars are the carriers and the vessels of this knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made their chests the containers into which this knowledge has been loaded and they carry it from those before them who preceded them on the path of knowledge until they hand it to those who will come after them. Knowledge is what brought mankind out of darkness into the light. In the hadith of Iyad ibn Himar al-Mujashi'i radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Indeed Allah has looked upon the people of the earth and despised them, both the Arabs and the non-Arabs, except for remnants from the people of the book. This hadith discusses a particular time period preceding the message of Muhammad wasallam before he was sent as a messenger. A time of great darkness after the passage of many years since the sending of Isa wasallam, The knowledge of the Injil had become unknown and people had fallen into the darknesses of pre-Islamic ignorance, al-jahiliyyah. And in that state of ignorance and darkness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despised mankind. Except for those remnants from the people of the book who were still upon the truth. Knowledge is what brought them out of that darkness into the light. Knowledge is what caused the abolishment of many practices that are considered barbaric, heinous, despicable practices. Such as Wa'dul Banat, the practice of burying girls as soon as they were born, out of fear that they will bring shame when they grow to their families. Knowledge will stop the practice of circumambulating the house of Allah, making tawaf naked. Some of the people of Jahiliyyah used to believe that this is an act of worship, to take off all their clothes and make tawaf around the Kaaba during certain circumstances, without any clothes on. Knowledge is what made this stop. Knowledge is what caused the pagan Arabs to stop the worship of stones and rocks and trees. It made them stop their mythical beliefs in things that could neither benefit them nor harm them. And instead, knowledge changed them from being from the lowest of nations and most ignorant of nations to the most prominent nation that has ever walked the face of the earth. Knowledge is what made them deserving of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying to them, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ These people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed with this verse, you were the best of nations ever brought out to mankind, are the same Arabs that just a few years prior to the revelation of this verse were pagan Arabs, idol worshippers. Ignorant, had it not been for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessing them with the sending of Muhammad salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. If we understand this, we will understand why the scholars are important. Because they are the bearers of this light, the inheritors of this gift, the carriers of this blessing, the preservers of guidance. If it were not for the scholars, this knowledge would not have reached us and we would fall into the same that those before us had fallen into in terms of misguidance and going astray. As for the second point that I had alluded to earlier, which is to distinguish between the topics of the importance of the scholars and the virtue of the scholars, the things that we will discuss today, inshallah, showing and highlighting the importance of the scholars are considered also texts that highlight their virtues, but... There are selected texts that are designed and aimed to show specifically why the scholars are of great importance and what things would be like without them. And likewise, you will find in some of these texts the clarification by which you can distinguish between scholars and those who act like scholars but are not from them. Although that is not the topic that we are aiming to cover. But as you can see, these topics intermingle. They are interconnected and there are common denominators between them. 
Moving on to our topic, the first text I want to mention is the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu that a man asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about al-mubasharah in a state of fasting. Al-mubasharah could mean things that occur between a man and his wife such as hugging or kissing and the like without having intercourse. Abu Hurairah said, فَرَخَّصَ له. So the Prophet sallallahu gave him permission to do so while fasting. Another man came to him and asked him, he said, فَنَهَاهُ He forbade him. Abu Hurairah then said, it turns out that the man the Prophet ﷺ gave him permission to was old. And the one that he forbade him was young. Narrated by Abu Dawood in the Sunan and others. At Albani rahimahullah, he said this is authentic. This hadith is an example of aspects that are unique to the scholars. Their knowledge is not superficial knowledge. Rather, their knowledge is deep, based on foundations, that allows them to cater their answers to the needs of people. Perhaps a youth who has memorized some narrations and studied a little bit of fiqh can overlook these subtleties and give the same answer to everyone. But the scholars who are rooted in knowledge, who have the foundations of knowledge, they look beyond what meets the eye, beyond the surface level. And they customize their answers to address the real needs of the people. How does this hadith indicate that? It shows that the Prophet ﷺ gave permission to the old man because there is nothing wrong with this. This is halal. For a fasting man to hug his wife, to kiss his wife while fasting, this has no effect on his fast. Because an old man is expected to contain himself and not fall into anything that is forbidden. And as for the youth, the young man, the Prophet ﷺ feared for him that if he engaged in these activities which are permissible, then that would excite him and tempt him to fall into that which is impermissible. So the Prophet ﷺ forbade him from what is halal because he knew that it would lead him to that which is haram. This is from the virtues of the scholars and from the things that indicate their importance. That the scholars are vital to the matter of protecting people from harms that people may perhaps not even foresee. If this same youth had gone to someone else who did not know anything except for the surface ruling and said to him, oh, this is halal, there's nothing wrong with this. And he did not look at his particular circumstances that this is a youth and this is a man that perhaps could be tempted by the strong desires and lusts that exist in young men, he may have led him into the practice of that which is forbidden by allowing him to practice that which is halal. Another example is found in the hadith of Abu Umam al-Bahili radiallahu anhu. He said, a young man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, O Messenger of Allah, grant me permission to fornicate. Ethan li bizzina. The companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they turned to this man and they started speaking to him harshly. And they said, Mah, mah, stop, cease, and be quiet, what are you saying? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, Udnu, come near me. So he came near to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he sat down. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, Atuhibbuhu li ummik? He said, La wallah, ja'alani allahu fida'ak. He said, I swear by Allah, no. I don't like this for my mother. Atuhibbuhu li ummik means, do you like this for your mom? He said, no, I swear by Allah. May Allah make me ransom to you. The Prophet ﷺ said, likewise the people, they do not like this for their mothers. Then he said, do you like this for your daughter? He said, la wallah ya Rasulullah. May Allah make me ransom to you. He said, likewise the people do not like it for their daughters. He said to him, do you like it for your sister? He said, La wallah, Ya Rasulullah. May Allah make me ransom to you. He said, Likewise, the people do not like it for their sisters. He said to him, Do you like it for your auntie, your, mater- your paternal aunt? He said, No, I swear by Allah, O Messenger of Allah, may Allah make me ransom to you. He said, Likewise, the people do not like it for their maternal aunt, paternal aunts. He said, Afutuhibbuhu li khalatik. Ammatik is paternal, khalatik is maternal. Do you like it for your maternal aunt? He said, no, I swear by Allah, Messenger of Allah, may Allah make me ransom to you. He said, likewise, the people, they do not like it for their maternal aunts. He said, the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa then put his hand on him and he said, 
اللهم اغفر ذنبه وطهر قلبه وحصن فرجه Oh Allah forgive his sins and cleanse his heart and make chaste his genitals Abu Umama said فلم يكن بعد ذلك الفتى يلتفت إلى شيء Since then that youth, that young man never looked at anything In other words this young man would walk in the streets looking at the ground looking at his feet He would not raise his eyes up and look at women going and coming looking at things that cause harm to the heart and desire to enter it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured him by the advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his dua. This is narrated by Imam Ahmad and others. Imam al-Albani authenticated it in a silsil al-sahih. Likewise, the Shaykh Muqbil in al-sahih al-musnad. This story shows the wisdom of the scholars. Look at how the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reacted. Despite their knowledge, despite their rank, despite their understanding. But look at how the Imam of all the scholars, our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, look how he reacted. He brought him near him. Instead of treating him like he was a madman, he talked to him. He made him connect the dots and understand the difference between looking at things from just the perspective of what I want to understanding the perspective of I'm a member of society. And what comes around goes around. And just how I don't want certain things to happen to my family, other people are the same. He made him connect to the body of the believers, to the community, to understand that he is a member of this society. And after addressing his mind, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua for him, starting with, Allahumma ghfir dhamba, O oh Allah forgive his sins. And this highlights to us the importance of forgiveness as a means to cleansing the heart. This is a very important piece of advice for the youth who may be listening that we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins because that is a means to cleanse our hearts and to preserve our chastity and to help us stay away from vice and sins by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This hadith is another example of the importance of the scholars. Imagine if this man had approached someone that was not knowledgeable. Someone who treated him with harshness and said to him, what is wrong with you? Are you crazy? Where would he go? Would he be found walking in the streets, looking at his toes? Or would he still remain upon that path? Perhaps if he was treated harshly, he would have lost hope in fixing himself and he would have committed sin. Another example is found in the hadith narrated by Bukhari and Muslim and many of the people of knowledge in their books, showing the story of (coughs) <coughs> the desert dweller, the Bedouin, who urinated in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The man stood one side and started urinating. The Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they got up to deal with this man. Some of the narrations indicate that they wanted to beat him. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, Da'uhu. In one narration he said, La tuzrimuhu. Do not interrupt his urination. And let him finish. When the man was done, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa advised him with gentleness and explain to him what the houses of Allah Azza wa are made for. They're made for prayers, for the recital of the Qur'an, for the recitation of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and for the remembrance of Allah. They are not suitable for any of these filthy matters. The man accepted the advice. And the Prophet sallallahu told the Sahaba to pour a large amount of water on that urine, a bucket's worth, or perhaps two buckets. This shows how the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt with this man because of knowledge. Instead of chasing the man out of the masjid, people carrying their shoes and trying to beat him, and perhaps he is still urinating, cannot stop, and the urine would spread in the masjid and so on and so forth. What ended up happening was what? The urine was contained in one spot, and then it was cleansed, and the man was taught gently. In one of the narrations, there is an additional wording. The Sahabi said, This desert dweller later on said after he gained some understanding in the religion, gained some fiqh, he said, this man, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got up to me, ransom to him be both my father and my mother. فَلَمْ يَسُبَّ وَلَمْ يُؤَنِّبْ وَلَمْ يَضْرِبْ And he did not call me names. And he did not blame me or berate me. And he did not hit. This man understood later on the virtues of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his kindness and the unique character that he had sallallahu wa sallam alayhi as a teacher. This man who earlier in the story 
in some of the narrations it is mentioned, he said, Allahumma arhamni wa Muhammadan wa la tarham ma'ana ahadan. Oh Allah, have mercy upon me and Muhammad and do not have mercy upon anyone else. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commented to him, he said, tahajjarta wasi'an. You made a vast thing, very small, meaning the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so vast and you made it so narrow, only fitting for two people. The man had very limited understanding. Later on when he gained understanding in the religion, he remembered this and he said the Prophet of Allah did not curse at me, did not call me names, did not berate me or make me feel bad. He did not hit me. Meaning, this was a call to Allah. This made me stay upon the religion. This made me stick to it until I gained knowledge and gained understanding. He went from being a person who would urinate in the masjid and call upon Allah to have mercy upon no one except for him and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to a person that the Sahabi narrating the story said he gained understanding into the religion. He gained fiqh because of how he was treated by Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam alayhi. Again, imagine if he had ended up maybe perhaps in one of our masajid today. Huh? You might find some of the brothers chasing him out of the masjid with their belts and with their shoes, if not worse. Maybe some people would beat him or even try to kill him. But such is the wisdom of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now someone may say, all these examples pertain to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but we are talking about the scholars. So where is the connection? The connection is found in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he said, الْعُلَمَاءُ وَرَثَةُ الْأَنْبِيَا The scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. They inherit the knowledge of the prophets. And likewise, they inherit the manners of the prophets in addition to the wisdom of the Prophets. The scholars, because of being immersed in this knowledge that was left behind by the scholars, uh, sorry, by the Prophets, they adopt and embrace the mannerisms and characteristics and the wisdom of the Prophets. And the more they do so, the more you see the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon them and upon their call. You see people revolving around them, learning from them, coming to them, surrendering <coughs> to their invitation to the truth, taking their advice, following their guidance, and trusting them with critical matters of their religion, and finding tremendous results and blessings in doing so. There is a story that highlights the difference between a scholar and someone who acts like a scholar when the people come to them for their needs. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaking about a man from Bani Israel. He said this man killed 99 people and then the urge to repent came upon him. And this shows us here, ikhwan, not to lose hope in our brothers and our sisters who have fallen into sins. Perhaps someone would look at the story of this man and from the very beginning rule against this person and say, what repentance? This man killed 99 souls. He's worse than some of the most famous serial killers in the world. But well, this story is actually showing us, as we shall see near the end, how this man succeeded with Allah. This man who killed 99 people, the Prophet ﷺ told us, he felt the urge to repent. So he started saying to the people, lead me, show me where the most knowledgeable person on earth is. He asked and he was led to a rahib. A worshipper. He was led to a rahib. So he went to the rahib, the monk or the like, and he told him his story. And he asked him if he could repent. The worshipper said to him, You killed 99 people and you want to repent? How can you repent? When he heard this, he took out his sword and he killed him. And he completed the count to 100. And this highlights how those who act like the scholars but are not from the scholars harm themselves before they harm others. Then the man felt the need and the urge to repent again. So he started asking the people again, lead me to the most knowledgeable person on the face of the earth. And this time they actually led him to a scholar. And this highlights how the people are fooled by worshippers. They are fooled by appearances. Many times the layman, the common folk, think that people who have a certain appearance are scholars. Just by the appearance. Whether it's an appearance of worship, or it's a specific dress code is found in some countries, or whether it's because of beautiful speech and ornamented uh, appearances, 
they judge based on that which they see without really looking past the visage, past the facade, into the realities of the person. At any rate, they led him to a real scholar the second time around. So he told him his story. And he asked him, can I repent? The scholar said to him, what stops you from repenting? In other words, it is as if he said to him, why not? What could stop you? Then he gave him advice. He said to him, leave your area. There are people who are a bad influence in that area. And instead, travel to such and such land where you will find righteous people who will help you. And so the man took the advice of the scholar and he traveled. And he traveled to his destiny because during that journey on the road, the angel of death came to collect his soul. And then the angels of mercy came to take his soul from the angel of death. And then the angels of punishment, Malaikatul Azab, also came to collect his soul from the angel of death. In one of the narrations, Iblis spoke up and he said, He is nearer to me. He never disobeyed me a single day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel to rule between these two angel sets. The angels of mercy were saying, We have a right to him. He came repentant. The angels of punishment said, We have a right to him. He never performed a single good deed. So Allah sent an angel to rule between them. And he ruled that the earth should be measured. The distance between where he started and where he's going. And if he's found to be closer to where he started, the angels of punishment take him. And if he's closer to where he is going, the angels of mercy take him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the earth. He commanded the earth to extend on the side of the land that he left and to shrink on the side of the land that he was heading to. And all the while the man, while his last breaths were leaving his body, was still trying to finish his trip, the trip that he was making for the sake of Allah, to go and join with those who are righteous. In his final moments, he simply moved his chest a little bit to inch closer to his destination. When the angels finished measuring, they found him to be exactly one hand span closer to his destination. So the angels of mercy took him. Look how the scholar who clearly inherited from the prophets their wisdom did not allow this man to lose hope in the mercy of Allah, nor did he make him feel safe from the punishment of Allah. Rather, he led him to that which caused his salvation. And he gave him advice beyond what he would just ask for. The man asked about repentance. He, asked, he answered him about repentance. But then he gave him additional advice. Advice that will protect him from falling into sin and vice again. From falling into the same old routines and habits and meeting the same people that egged him on and proved to be bad companions. That facilitated for him his crimes. The scholar gave him advice that would remove him and then replant him in an entirely new environment that would allow him to become firm in his new life, life of righteousness and worship. And by following the scholar's advice, the man's akhirah, his hereafter, was saved. Instead of ending up in the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he ended up in his mercy. This is another example highlighting the importance of the scholars and how the salvation of people is hinged upon accepting the advice of the scholars based upon the text of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Another aspect that clarifies the importance of the scholars is the actions they take out of their own accord without being asked. Some of the examples we have already seen show how the scholars are beneficial when they are asked. And this highlights to us that one of the greatest ways we benefit by the scholars is by going to them with questions and asking them and involving them in our affairs, in our lives, connecting ourselves to them. But they are also important because they take action on their own, even when people don't come to them. Or even when people ask them about the wrong things, they answer about that which is more important. An example of that is the man who the Prophet ﷺ responded to him with something more beneficial than what he asked about. The man asked the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him, Mata sa'a? When is the Day of Judgment? The Prophet ﷺ responded and he said, Mada a'adadta laha? What have you prepared for it? Instead of answering him about a question that has no benefit in it, when is the Day of Judgment? There's no benefit to answering this question. In fact, it could be harmful. In addition to the fact that the answer is not even known. 
So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam instead directed him to knowledge that is more important. Mada a'dad talaha? What have you prepared for it? Forcing the man to think instead about that which is beneficial. Preparing for the day of judgment. This is what matters. Not when it is. When it is, is of no consequence unless you are prepared for it. So this is what matters. If you're prepared for it, let it come when it comes. Whether it comes tomorrow or it comes a year from now or at any future time, as long as you're prepared for it, you will go to Jannah. So he said to him, Mada adatalaha? The scholars have inherited this from the prophets. Out of their own accord, they will teach the people to ask about that which is beneficial and leave alone questions that are harmful. Questions that have no merit, no bearing on the reality and circumstances of the people. Another example of how the scholars take action on their own, even when they are not addressed by the people, is in the story of the Khawarij in the time of Ali radiallahu anhu. This, uh, this story is narrated in many books, such as the Musannaf of Abdul Razzaq, and <clears throat> in the book of uh, Al-Hilya, Li Abi Nu'aym, and narrated by Al-Bayhaqi and others, Al-Imam Al-Nasai also narrated it. In this story it is mentioned that Abdullah ibn al-Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he said to Ali radiallahu anhu, let me go and talk to the Khawarij. This is a group of people who took an extremist approach to Islam and they focused almost exclusively on the appearances so they would worship extensively and pray for lengthy periods of time. They would read the Qur'an and read and read and read and read and they wouldn't worry too much about its meanings. So they had a very superficial understanding of the Qur'an. They would fast until the Sahaba started thinking that their fasting is nothing by comparison to the fasting of the Khawarij. And they would fast even more than the Sahaba. But their take on the religion was a superficial one, an extremist one. What was the end result of that? That they became ignorant. They worshipped in a way that harmed their seeking of knowledge. They became disconnected from the knowledge. And they became disconnected from the people of knowledge. So they did not sit with the Sahaba, they did not mingle with the Sahaba, they did, did not take knowledge from the Sahaba. And eventually, they took a side all to their own and they started saying the Sahaba are wrong. And the Sahaba are mistaken. And they, some of them went so far as to say the Sahaba are disbelievers. They became extremists. And they started planning to go to war against the Sahaba. The point is, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he asked Ali for permission to go and talk to them. Perhaps they will benefit from this. Allah will bring good out of it. Ali at first was worried for him, that they would harm him. But eventually, he became convinced and he allowed Ibn Abbas to go and talk to them. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, he went to them and he spoke to them and he heard their arguments and why they decided to take sides and to go to war against the Sahab, to go to war against Ali radiallahu anhu and those who were with him. He said to them, what if I read to you from the book of Allah and the sunnah of his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that which will refute your arguments, would you repent? They said yes. Notice how Abdullah ibn Abbas said to them, if I read to you from the book of Allah and the sunnah of his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In other words, he came to them armed with knowledge as a scholar. He came to them with that which all Muslims must cede to, must adhere to. Would you repent? They said yes. So he debated them with the Qur'an and the Sunnah. He said, as, if, as for your first argument, you said such and such, and Allah says such and such. He made his argument clear, and then he asked them, are we done with this one? They said, Allahumma na'am. Then he went to the second point and the third point, until he left them no legs to stand on. At the end of that narration, it is mentioned that 2,000 of them repented. 2,000 of them repented in one day. As for the rest of them, those who remained stubborn, they ended up being killed at the hands of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum because they chose to go to war against the companions. So Allah Azza wa Jal gave the companions victory against them and they were defeated and killed. Killed as misguided individuals. <coughs> This shows us how the scholars will sometimes choose to involve themselves in situations where they see that great danger exists and great harm is potentially about to come and Allah brings tremendous good upon their hands. If Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah 
did not involve himself in this situation, would these 2,000 people have repented in a single day? Indeed, it was the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon this ummah that the likes of Ibn Abbas were present and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for this good to happen. There are many more points that can be made to highlight the importance of the scholars and evidence to be discussed. However, due to time constraints, perhaps I will just allude to brief or maybe just headers or main points that touch upon some of the aspects that highlight the importance of the scholars. An example of that is the statement of Al-Hasan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala where he said, Al-Alimu yara al-fitna wa hiya muqbila wa nas la yarawnaha illa wa hiya mudbira The scholar sees the fitna while it is approaching. People hear the scholars talking about fitna that are on their way and they may think that the scholar is acting like an oracle or a farseer or somebody who claims to have the knowledge of the future. Whereas in reality, the scholar is simply very familiar with the patterns that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clarified in his book and that have been clarified in the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he sees the beginnings of a fitna that has occurred in the past in previous nations or in the history of this nation, he can recognize that this is the same thing about to repeat itself. So he begins warning the people from it before it occurs. As for the people, they only see the fitna while it's on its way out. Yani after the mayhem has occurred, after the blood has been shed, after the honor has been desecrated, after great harm has befallen the ummah, then the people realize that this was a fitna. This was a trial. After they have fallen into it. And this is why we are always advised to stick to our scholars in times of fitna. Because they are the ones that are most likely to see the way out of the fitna. Some of the scholars of old used to say, the similitude of a scholar amongst the people is like a man holding a lantern and helping people travel in the dark. So those who walk with him will reach safety. As for those who walk away and continue traversing in the dark, they will fall into harms. From the matters that also highlight the importance of the scholars is the fact that the scholars have carried the knowledge. And so they are the containers of the knowledge that will deliver it to the next generation of the ummah. So if we are disconnected from the scholars, we are disconnected from the knowledge. In other words, disconnected from every source of success. And it should be highlighted that the only way people will learn the knowledge is if they find it with those who are worthy of carrying it. If the people find the knowledge with those who they deem unworthy, they will not take it from them. They will not take the knowledge from the ignorant or from the foul-mouthed or from the crooked and the dishonest the cheaters, the liars, the embezzlers, they will not take knowledge from those who they deem unfit for knowledge, unfit to bend their knees and sit in front of them to learn from them. So we are indebted to the scholars for making themselves available, while at the same time they are a worthy role model for us. Because in reality, they have preserved the knowledge for the ummah. It should be noted that it has become very common in our time that knowledge is taken from those who are unworthy. And this is a very strange affair indeed because you will still find that most people look for the best in every field. If a man needs a surgery performed, he will look for the best doctor in his area to perform that surgery, so long as he can afford it. And if he needs some renovations performed in his home, he will look for the best technician or uh, worker or skilled laborer to perform that renovation for him in his area, so long as he could afford it. Some people will not spare an expense until they get their very best. This is normally how people operate. They look for their very best. But this is indeed a very strange phenomenon that has occurred of late, where people take knowledge from everyone. As if specialization is recognized in every field of life, except for the religion. Nobody needs to be specialized in the religion. This is very strange. And it contradicts the sound mind. And it shows that these people look at religion as a shallow matter. That it has no depth to it. And so everybody is qualified to be a scholar. Likewise, from the importance of the scholars, is that they clarify the truth once they learn it. Even if they recognize that the clarification of the truth could bring them harm 
to their person, to their family members, to those near them. And this is also in following in the footsteps of the Prophets. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he warned his people of the hellfire. Even when they wanted to harm him, tried to kill him, forced him out of Mecca, and so on and so forth, the scholars until today, they do the same. They speak with the truth, even if it causes them personal harm, as long as the truth is clarified to the people. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala continued to give the fatwa that if a man divorces his wife thrice in a single sitting without taking her back in between, in a single sitting three times, this is considered what? One divorce, not three. He continued to say this and promote that this is the truth in the matter and this is the correct verdict in this particular issue despite the fact that many people in his era were upon an opposing view. And they viewed it to be that this woman is no longer halal for this man. That she has been completely separated from him. And the only way she could ever come back to him is after marrying someone else. But Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, in opposition to all of those, or many of those in his era, continued to speak the truth that he knows. Even when they caused trouble for him with the government, and they tried to get him imprisoned, and harmed, and such and such, he continued to speak with the truth. And promote the fatwa and the verdict that he believed to be the correct one. Regardless of cost to him and harm that comes to him. Likewise from the importance of the scholars is the fact that they are the ones who are waging the greatest jihad. Jihad is two types. Jihad of the word and jihad of the sword. Sword with an S. If you remove the S it becomes word. These two types of jihad are both mentioned in the Quran. The ayat, the verses mentioning the jihad of the sword are many and perhaps well known. As such, there is no reason to mention them right now. But as for the jihad of the word, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا And wage with it against them a great jihad. And wage with it against them a great jihad. It, as mentioned in this ayah, <coughs> by the consensus of the scholars, refers to the Qur'an. In other words, the ayah means, and wage with the Qur'an against them a tremendous jihad. How do you make jihad with the Qur'an? By using the knowledge found in it, its proofs, its evidences, its arguments, to defeat the arguments of the disbelievers, to refute the falsehood that they come with, to expose the feeble nature of their attempts to hide and confuse and obfuscate the truth. All of this is jihad. Allah commanded Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to wage with the Qur'an a tremendous jihad, a great jihad. Against who? The disbelievers and the hypocrites and all of the enemies of Allah who attempt to confuse the people and hide the truth. So Allah jalla wa ala commanded his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with this and today the only people who follow his sunnah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this particular matter are the scholars. In fact, no one but the scholars is equipped to wage this type of jihad. The jihad of the word. Because it requires study and knowledge of the fundamentals of the religion. Knowledge of the tafsir and the fiqh and the hadith. Knowledge of the usul, the principles of fiqh. Knowledge of the mustalah. Knowledge of al-nasikh wal mansukh the abrogating and the abrogated, amongst other things. Without knowledge of those things, a man is not qualified to wage this type of jihad. And if he is partially qualified because of gaining some kind of knowledge, he will be limited in his ability to wage this jihad by the limitations of his knowledge. This is why we see in our era, in our times, that many statements of falsehood are spreading because the scholars have become fewer and rarer and they are dealing with many statements of falsehood on many fronts there's not enough of them to cover the needs of the ummah and respond to every falsehood a final point I want to make regarding the importance of the scholars is in reference to a misconception that some may have where perhaps someone will say well what if someone says we have the knowledge in the books what harm is it if the scholars die? Although the answer has already preceded, we have mentioned many points that clarify why the scholars are far more than just books that are walking. 
They are not dry knowledges found in the books, rather they are alive, cognizant, and seeing, able to see the fitan before they come, able to see the different needs of those who are asking questions and perhaps answering them with that which is more important than that which they asked about. Able to see the differences between people asking questions and how one person needs a different answer from another, although their question is exactly identical. Among the many, many points that we mentioned, highlighting how the scholars are more than simply books, it behooves us to look at the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, as narrated in Bukhari, Indeed, Allah does not take the knowledge by taking it from men, from the chests of men. Rather, He takes the knowledge by taking the scholars. Rather, He takes the knowledge by taking the scholars. If the scholars die, the knowledge is gone. If the scholars die, the knowledge is gone. Once the scholars pass away, this means Allah has taken the knowledge. We have to stop here and pause and carefully consider the statement of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, he takes the knowledge by taking the scholars. Taking here means collecting their souls at the time of their death. So once the scholars die, the knowledge has been taken. We have to stop and think about this because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has confirmed that there is indeed a phenomenon that occurs in this ummah. And that phenomenon is Allah Azza wa Jal taking the knowledge. So point number one we take from this narration is the knowledge shall be taken. Point number two is that this knowledge is not going to be taken by being pulled out of the chests of people. This is not how the knowledge will disappear. This is not how the knowledge will be taken. So how then will it be taken? Point number three, the knowledge will be taken by the death of the scholars. So long as the scholars are alive, Allah Azza wa Jal will preserve the knowledge by preserving them. But once the time for the collection of knowledge has come, Allah will collect them. In other words, Allah will collect the souls of the scholars. What happens to the world when the scholars die? In the same hadith, Prophet ﷺ said, حَتَّى إِذَا لَمْ يُبْخِي عَالِمَ Until the point comes where no scholar remains. Mankind will place in charge ignorant leaders. Mankind, the people, will place in charge ignorant leaders. And then they will be asked. They will be asked, meaning about matters of religion. And then they will issue verdicts, meaning that due to their ignorance, they will not know where to stop. Due to their ignorance, they will not know to say, I don't know. Due to their ignorance, their pride will prevent them from saying, I did not study this. Due to their ignorance, they will not recognize the danger of speaking about the religion without knowledge. Due to their ignorance, they will not see the ramifications of speaking will far outweigh the benefit of appearing to know. So they will talk about the religion of Allah without knowledge and they will issue verdicts based on ignorance. So he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they will be asked and they will issue verdicts without knowledge. Then he said, so they will become misguided and they will become misguiders. They will become misguided in themselves and they will become misguiders, meaning of others. This is the consequence. This is what will happen upon the earth when the scholars are no longer, when they are gone. And this is exactly what we are seeing today. The more the numbers of the scholars reduce, the larger the number of ignorant leaders of societies and communities and pockets of people who are ignorant become. And the people do the exact thing that the Prophet ﷺ warned against in this hadith and they ask them about their religion while they are ignorant. And they will respond while they are ignorant. And they will respond with ignorance. They will become misguided. And they will misguide others. We seek the refuge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from this. In conclusion, I hope that the topic, which is the importance of the scholars, has received renewed interest within our mental spheres. And I hope that we can all walk away from this talk thinking about the great need, rather I should say the dire need, for creating replacements for the scholars. The fact of the matter is, that the only way to mitigate the harms of the death of the scholars is by finding scholars to replace them and substitute for them. And this can only happen as long as there is a group effort in creating future generations of scholars. I say this because some of us have the natural gifts necessary to become scholars of the future. O oh, slave of Allah, if Allah has given you these gifts, do not let them go to waste. Rather, apply yourself and study. 
Perhaps Allah Azza wa will benefit the Ummah of Muhammad through you one day. I also say this because some of us have financial means to support students of knowledge or slave of Allah. If you are from those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed wealth upon, use that wealth to preserve the knowledge of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Preserve it by allowing people to study it while you cover their financial needs. There are students of knowledge all around the globe living on a hundred dollars a month or less. Or less, they need our support. I say this because there are some of us who have knowledge but are not spreading it. While there are those who desire to learn it and indicate that they are ready to receive it. But we are not putting forth the effort to spread that knowledge and teach it and make it available. O slave of Allah, if you are from those who have knowledge, Allah has bestowed it upon you. Make yourself available for the people. And be from those who transmit the knowledge of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the people. Let the knowledge move forward. In fact, I say this because each and every one of us can have a role in the spread of knowledge and the preservation of knowledge and the creation of future generations of scholars in this ummah. Even a housewife at home making dua, asking Allah to make her children scholars is from those who are participating in the creation of the future generation of scholars. Do not belittle any effort. Do not belittle any ambition in the pursuit of this tremendous goal. And also in conclusion, I want to say that none of the texts that I used tonight highlighting the importance of the scholars indicate in any way, shape or form that we should become extremists regarding the scholars and treat them as something that they are not. Extremism in the religion is harmful regardless of what shape or form it takes. We don't want to act like deviants who treat their scholars as if they are infallible, that their every word is correct, that every action they make must be based on the sunnah. This is not correct. This is not true. This is falsehood. And Imam Malik rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, he said, كُلٌّ يُؤْخَذُ مِنْ قَوْلِهِ وَيُرَدْ إِلَّا صَاحِبَ هَذَا الْقَبْرِ Everyone will have some of his speech rejected and some accepted except for the one who has this grave. And he pointed at the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We are not extremists regarding the scholars. We recognize that they are humans. They err. They make mistakes. They can forget something. They say one thing today and tomorrow they might say something different. Do not hold against them their mistakes. Respect them. Recognize their virtues and their status and their importance. And recognize that their mistakes are so few in number and insignificant when weighed against and compared to that which they are correcting, that, that which they are guided in, that which they are benefiting the ummah in. So do not let their mistakes push you away and make you lose interest in them. But recognize the fact that they are humans and they have mistakes. And also on the other side, the complete opposite of that, are those who are trying to disconnect us from the scholars. There is a movement that has been in existence for many, many years of people who are trying to disconnect the ummah from the scholars. They are basically trying to bury the scholars alive. They're not going to wait until the scholars die and the knowledge is gone. That's too long for them. So for them, the approach has become to bury the scholars alive. Bury them with lies, bury them with propaganda, but busy them with things that are of no benefit and the likes. These people are equally harmful to the Ummah as those who kill the scholars. And they have the same motivation as the children of Israel whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticized for killing the prophets and killing the scholars whenever they came to them with things that contradict their desires. This group takes many approaches to disconnect the Ummah from its scholars. An example of that is they find one mistake of a scholar and they amplify it and make a humongous deal of it to the point that it seems that the scholar has deviated, turned 180 degrees and started going to the path of the enemies of Allah. They do not recognize that the people of Sunnah are people of fairness and that we do not let go of our scholars because of one mistake or two or three. If a scholar has been correct in several thousand verdicts and he makes a mistake in two or three issues, this is not enough reason to name a scholar a deviant. I've met some of these individuals who have basically limited the scholarship of the Ummah in two or three individuals. They don't recognize any scholars in the Ummah except for two or three individuals. Everyone else, not a scholar. This is how impoverished the Ummah is in their eyes. This is how severe their circumstances are. They act as if every single scholar on the face of the earth has been assessed and found wanting. 
found lacking, except for two or three scholars. Everyone else, yeah, student of knowledge, maybe you can benefit from him a few things, sit in his class, maybe, but the scholars are only two or three. Indeed, this is a very strange claim that has no connection to reality, no bearing on the truth. They forget the fact that Musa alayhi salatu was salam, Musa alayhi salatu was salam, did not know of the existence of Al-Khadr and his level of knowledge. Despite Allah Azza wa revealing to Musa that Al-Khadr is more knowledgeable than you. Musa, from the greatest of the prophets and messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, did not know of the existence or level of knowledge of Al-Khadr, as narrated in Bukhari. So how could they make the claim that they are aware of every person of knowledge on the face of the earth and that they have decided that the scholarship is limited in two or three people? This is surely misguidance manifest. <coughs> Another approach they have is based on the motive to become the people in charge where they try to eliminate the scholars in order for them to take the reins of the da'wah, to become the go-to people, to become the leaders of the da'wah. They are not eliminating the scholars because the scholars have deviated. Rather, they are eliminating the scholars in order to take the helm, to become the person that people come to. And whether they are seeking matters of the dunya, such as fame and wealth or what have you, or whether it is because they are seeking power and to become the person who gets to say what gets done, what does not get done, and so on and so forth. But these are their motives. So they eliminate the scholars using their varied and many tactics, such that their followers become blinded to the fact that they are scholars and have no one else to turn to but them. Instead of connecting the people to the book and the sunnah and to the scholars of the ummah, they are connecting the people to themselves. These are also people we must be aware of. Be very careful not to fall into their traps or believe in their lies or fall into their alternative reality and adopt that version that they are espousing. Scholars are many. The ummah is well. The women of this ummah are still giving birth to brilliant men and brilliant women who memorize the book of Allah and thousands of the narrations of Rasulullah who memorize the various mutun in the various disciplines of knowledge and who dedicate their lives, their days and their nights to the spread of knowledge. The scholars are well and plenty and many. Yes, not enough. But they are far beyond the two or three that they count. There are many scholars in the likes of the lands of Saudi Arabia, the land of Egypt, the land of Yemen, and many other places. Beyond count. Beyond count. Only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their numbers. But surely not enough. We need more. So do not believe that lie. The scholars are limited in numbers. Two or three. All living in the same city. As those people claim. And they have many other approaches and tactics that they use in order to disconnect the people from the scholars and since this is not our topic tonight I just wanted to touch upon it because it has a direct relation to the topic of tonight which is the importance of the scholars scholars are important for all the reasons that we have mentioned and many more that we have not mentioned while these people are attempting to disconnect you from them they want to leave you at risk of losing all those benefits that are obtained by being connected to the scholars so beware of those people and beware of their manhaj, their methodology. Beware of their call, a call to self-elevation, self-praise, versus a call to the book of Allah and to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to the recognition of the scholars of the ummah. We seek the refuge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from being from those who have enmity towards the scholars. And in conclusion, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make sincere for his sake what was said tonight and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it beneficial for the one who said it and for those who hear it and that Allah Jalla wa ala accept it with him and make it heavy on our scales the effort that we have all put together in coming together to partake in this event we ask Allah Jalla wa ala to bless this effort and to bring many more events like this to us in the future and in conclusion Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka wa an'ama ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in